name is Amanda Smith and I am from Utah in the United States. My family is a mixed family. Uh, my mom is from Georgia, that's the southern region of the United States, and my father is actually from Canada. Um, but they met in Utah to go to Brigham Young University, that is the Mormon University in Utah. Um, most of, both of my parents um, were Mormons at the time, um, and unfortunately when I was young they got divorced and my mother remarried um, to the man who raised me who was from El Salvador. Um, so I had a mixed race background, um, I identified as a Latina, I had a quinceanera, which is um, their big birthday party that they have um, for girls when they turn 15 and I got to wear a poofy dress and <laughs> everything, and alhamdulillah. Um, I have three little brothers. One is my full blood brother and, and the other two are from my stepdad, but they're all just my siblings. Um, so um, religiously, I was raised as a Mormon. Um, the majority of the people in Utah are Mormon or Latter-day Saints. Um, and uh, I was very religious when I was young. I was very active in my church. Um, I was always um, offering to help. I got what's called the Personal Progress Award. It's this um, big project that all the teenage girls have to do. You have to do seven 70 hour long research and, and service projects in order to get this special award. And I was the only one in my age group who had gotten it. Um, I was very studious when I was young as well. Um, I read the Book of Mormon on my own when I was about 14. Um, and uh, the Book of Mormon is their text that they have in addition to the Bible. So I would say I was very religious. However, that started to change when I was a teenager. Mormons have four main books. They have the Bible, the Book of Mormon, what's called the Doctrine and Covenants, which you can kind of think of as like hadiths. Um, they're stories about their prophet, Joseph Smith, and they also contain laws about how to do some of their ordinances and practices. And the last book they have is called um, The Pearl of Great Price, which they believe was translated from um, an Egyptian scroll and contains more details about um, some of the other prophets that are not in the Bible. So I, I was very religious um, as a young teenager. So when I was 14, when I read the Book of Mormon on my own, it was a very uplifting experience for me. I was really into it and it's, uh, it has some very powerful, very interesting stories in that book. Um, but things started to change a little bit um, when I started to read the New Testament. And I found in the New Testament, right in the beginning, is the Sermon on the Mount, a Sermon on the Mount, um, which is a very famous sermon where Nabi Isa um, gets on a mountain, gives this sermon to these Jewish people, and it's where he um, has his most famous lines, like "Blessed are the meek, blessed are those who mourn." That. Um, and as I was reading it, I felt like, you know, I feel like I've just read this somewhere. Where have I read this? And I realized I had read it in the Book of Mormon. So near the end of the Book of Mormon, they believe that um, Nabi Isa salam, appeared in, in this, the Americas and was teaching the, Jewish, the, um, the people here about the faith and things like that. And he essentially gives them the Sermon on the Mount. And when you read in near the back of the Book of Mormon where this happens, it's almost exactly word for word what is written in the King James Version of the Bible. And as a 14-year-old, I realized that that didn't really make any sense because the Book of Mormon, they believe, is translated directly into English from the early 1800s from what they call the language of the Egyptians. It's never really specified what language of the Egyptians specifically, but the language of the Egyptians directly into English. And they also talk about how the Bible has undergone a lot of translations from translations from translations. Um, lots of things have been changed and edited. And so having that knowledge of the Bible, I realized there's no way that a text directly translated into that time of English could not be almost exactly word for word of a story from the Bible that's been taken from a translation from a translation from a translation into English that was spoken several hundred years earlier. Um, so that was a big blow to me, but I didn't really know how to handle that. And I would try to ask questions, but the society there, because everyone there is LDS, um, it's very hush-hush and people are, are really discouraged from asking questions. Um, I also had a few other issues, like my understandings of the relationship we're supposed to have with Jesus. Um, what Mormons teach is a little different from mainstream Christians. So they believe that Jesus is our literal brother, 
that Jesus has a wife and that before we came to this world that we were all born as spirit children and Jesus is our literal brother. Um, and they do believe that Jesus died for our sins and they do believe in the virgin birth. Um, and so they, they do praise him and he does have like an extra high sort of station within Mormonism belief, but he's also your literal brother. And so it, that relationship didn't make sense to me and didn't really add up. And I really struggled to understand things like why someone would need to die for God to forgive your sins. Why can't God just forgive you? And if this guy is my literal brother, then how come it's even necessary for him to have this extra station, yet my other brother, it just didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And when I would ask questions, no one could really explain to me wh what this relationship is supposed to be like, why it's that way. I never got a very good answer. And so that's what started to trigger me towards beginning to question my faith. And uh, because the society there, everyone there is Mormon, um, and it's, it's very closed off, I thought that the reason I was having doubts in the Mormon faith was because I was a bad person, because I wasn't good enough, because I listened to that song that says the one bad word, and so my whole soul was just corrupted, and it was my fault. And I went through this period of really low self-esteem. Um, and subhanAllah, a very interesting thing is what changed that. So I was about 15 or 16 and I went to a girls camp and they do this every year with the teenage girls in the Mormon church. They go off for a week to have a camp and every year there's a theme for the camp and that year the theme was a mighty change of heart. And it's based off of one of their scriptures that essentially says um, if you are having doubts in the religion you just need to have a mighty change of heart and then you'll start to believe again, right? And so the whole week, I just felt so awful about myself that I wasn't open enough, that I wasn't good enough. That's why I'm not having this mighty change of heart. And I felt really horrible about myself. And on the last day, it was just the epitome of bad days because they had a huge program and everyone was singing and there were plays about mighty change of heart. And I just felt because I wasn't good enough and for some reason I wasn't having this but I wanted to and so I made the choice to kind of walk off by myself you're not really supposed to do that but I just needed to breathe so I walk off by myself outside and I'm basically just talking to God in my heart and I'm like okay if this church is true just just let me know it just let me accept it and whatever I don't understand I will have the patience to understand later and I'm feeling nothing 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 and then I get this feeling to kneel down on the ground on friggin' dirt and put my head on the earth in what I later found out was called sujood. And subhanAllah, like, when my head was on that earth, I felt salam, I felt peace, and I didn't think I was a bad person anymore. But I didn't feel like the Mormon church was true. <laughs> And uh, I stayed there for a while, and then I came back up. And I still felt that salam, and, but I didn't feel the Mormon church was true. And so I walked forward that day feeling more comfortable with myself to embrace my doubts and to think more critically. And uh, as a teenager, um, I explored a lot of different faiths. And so to talk about how I started to learn about Islam, I'll need to rewind a little bit. So um, the sujood actually, I didn't really even think about till after I became a Muslim and learned what it was, um, subhanAllah. But my, my first exposure to Islam was unfortunately through 9-11. I was in grade school. Um, and once again, because Utah was such a closed off society, there were no other Muslims there, of course. There was a lot of just whew, hate um, shooting right up. And uh, for some reason, I knew these Muslims weren't all terrorists and they didn't all abuse women. And I would argue with people about this and say, you can't speak about other human beings this way. Um, but interest in, in Islam started more academically when I was in the ninth grade. We had a world civilizations class everyone was required to take. And we had a lesson about Islam one day. And I remember we brought in a special presenter and the presenter played the Avon in class. And this is before YouTube, so it wasn't a very good recording and the speakers weren't too great. And so when he played it, it didn't sound too well. <laughs> and everyone freaks out and all the students are, are covering their ears. And I had this jerk reaction to 
cover mine as well, but I felt, no, I need to listen to this. So I kept my hands down and I listened to the Alon. And after that, I was just sort of interested in Islam academically. So I began learning about the Middle East. I got really into what was going on um, in Israel and Palestine. I started to learn Arabic. I learned how to read and write myself from watching YouTube videos. Um, and Islam, I just enjoyed learning about it. I started to read the Quran. I thought Ramadan was very interesting. But I never seriously thought about it as a religion for myself. Um, when I went to college, I chose to study Arabic for my language, and I, I majored in international studies. And uh, I met a lot of Muslims in my classes who were very good and very patient with my many, many, many questions. Um, and alhamdulillah, I, I was guided to very good Muslims who were very knowledgeable and had the best of akhlaq. In the, in the Quran, right before I converted, I was influenced um, by, um, in Surah Sharah, where it says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And uh, at that time, it, it was just very uplifting for me. I was going through a lot of changes and struggles, and college is always hard. But it was a nice reminder that even though there's these hardships, ma'a and usri, there's yusra, there's ease with it. And it helped me to realize that there's going to be hard things, but there's always easy things at the same time. And to focus on looking at the glass as half full. What's interesting, before, when, when I first saw hijabs, you know, I always thought they were very pretty. Um, but I did think some of the myths about them, that they were oppressive. Um, but what started to change for me was my third year of college. And this is where I would say my path really towards becoming a Muslim started. So I was on campus and I saw a girl from one of my Arabic classes who I had seen every day um, for years at that point. And every day she always wore a simple, black abaya like this and a hijab just very simply wrapped. She never did anything too fancy. And for some reason that one day when I saw her on campus, I thought to myself, she looks like a princess and I want to look just like that. And I felt this sort of shock go through me, but then I, I snapped out of it and I thought, no, 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 no. I, I can't look like that. I'm an atheist. I can't look that way. And, but I couldn't get hijab out of my head. So I told myself, oh, well, if I'm going to go to the Middle East, I'm learning Arabic, I should uh, at least know how to put one on. So I started watching hijab tutorials online. And I started digging into the philosophy of why Muslim women wear hijab. And what I found was that it was actually a very feministic expression. And for me as a feminist, it really resonated with my beliefs and I found it to be the best way to express myself as a feminist. And this is the way I saw hijab. So uh, essentially, mainstream feminists now, especially those involved in the anti-rape culture movement, have the belief that a woman has a right to her own body and that someone else doesn't have the right to te treat her like a sex object without her consent. What I saw within hijab is that the reason why someone wear hijab is because they have a right to their own body and we have the right not to be treated like sex objects, right? So that underlying idea was the same. The difference was the external manifestation. On one side you see less clothes because the idea is because this is my right, it doesn't matter how I dress because my rights are due to me. And on this side, the Muslim woman is covered. And so the difference here is instead of a woman being uncovered and being completely dependent on a man, to give her her rights, you're taking it in your own hands. Because even though someone might try to look and might try to treat you like a sex object, they can't. It's, it's a shield. And so I felt like as a woman who had a right to my own body and didn't want to be looked at inappropriately, didn't want to be treated inappropriately, I just put a hijab on. And I was an atheist feminist. <laughs> and I felt like that was the best way to express myself as a feminist. And subhanAllah, it had a very powerful effect on me very quickly and a lot of things I, I wasn't expecting. So I, the way I saw myself drastically changed. I used to think I was very ugly. And a lot of uh, Western women, unfortunately, do feel like they're ugly. With all this media, you need the tight clothes and you need to look so sexy and just paint that makeup on. You never feel pretty enough. You never feel good enough. And I never felt pretty enough for good enough. And I realized once I put on a hijab that the reason that was, it had nothing to do with what I actually looked like. 
it had to do with the fact that my appearance every day was about everyone else. And when you're about everyone else, you're never good enough. But when I put on a hijab, the way I looked was now about me. And I felt good enough. And it got to the point where I could look at myself in the mirror without makeup and not cringe and, and turn away. SubhanAllah. And so I, I kept it. And there was nothing that was going to make me take it off. So after I started wearing a hijab, I went to Jordan for a while. I had an internship there at the University of Jordan. And while I was there, subhanAllah, I also met the best of Muslims with the best of akhlaq. And they really took a lot of time to teach me a lot of things and to answer my questions. And after three months there, I came back to the US. I graduated from college and I chose to move to California. And in that time, I just, I couldn't get Islam out of my head. And there was a little piece of me that was saying, maybe you could do this. But there was another little piece of me saying, no, you can't. You're, you're an atheist. You, you, you can't. You can't be a Muslim. But I would find myself every single day on the internet reading more and just, just trying to get more answers, just trying to figure it out. And there was one moment after about six months of this, it was one o'clock in the morning. I'm in my apartment reading about Islam again. And in that moment, none of my doubts, none of my concerns, none of my fears mattered. And I stood up and I said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. And I just, that was it. And I never looked back, subhanAllah. And there have been a lot of difficulties along the way, but the benefits I've had just the benefits I've had greatly outweigh those difficulties. And alhamdulillah, I was very lucky in that my family was very accepting. My mother um, has been my greatest champion. She did the greatest thing for me. I told her that since I was starting to wear a hijab, I didn't want pictures with my hair showing on Facebook anymore. And she was very kind and she took them off her Facebook. And then she went to our house and all the pictures of me in the house, she moved to the private bedroom so when guests came over they wouldn't see it. And then she printed off a picture of me in a hijab off Facebook and she put that at her desk at work. And her coworkers see this and they were just shocked. There's a picture of a Muslim in our office. And she picks up this picture and she holds it in front of her coworkers and she says, this is my daughter and you have to look at her. <laughs> And she just every day, she's been a fighter for me and a supporter for me. And she is the reason Jinnah is at the feet of your mother, alhamdulillah. So my, my first year was very difficult. Um, the first difficulty I had was honestly just getting accurate information. So I was still hungry for knowledge. And I was digging and, and trying to learn more about Islam. I came across a lot of Salafi, Wahhabi, very hateful, ugly ideologies of Islam. And I never believed that that was a religion of God. One thing growing up, um, let me start. So one thing as I was growing up, my stepfather, he came to the United States as a refugee. And he had always taught me the importance of respecting other people from other cultures and other ideologies. And I always had a very strong sense of human rights. But when I was reading the Salafi Wahhabi ideology, there was no sense of human rights or, or respect for other human beings. And so I, I just really struggled to, with the idea that, is this what Islam is? I, I, don't, I don't feel that way. And what started to change was um, one very kind Iraqi brother, um, his name was Abdul Sadah, and unfortunately he went back to Iraq after only knowing him for a few weeks, but I'm very grateful to him. And uh, he was Shi'i, and he told me about this cool book called Nahjul Balagha, and he talked to me about little things like, oh, well, we combine the prayers and we do these things a little bit differently. And so it kind of opened my mind up to start looking into Shi'a Islam. And so I found Sayyid Amar Nakhshawani's lectures on YouTube. And it was through finding his lectures I found the School of Ahl al-Bayt. And what really moved me about the School of Ahl al-Bayt is the sense of akhlaq, the sense of respect for other individuals. The story of uh, Imam al-Hussein really touched me in the sense that he was not standing in Karbala just for Muslimin or just for Shias. He was standing for all of mankind and he had a Christian with him. He had a Christian with a disability with him standing there. He had women, 
he had children. There are Hindus who love an Hussein, and he, he's a figure for all of mankind, and he's the reason why I am proud to say I am a Shia of Hussein. So once as a teenager I finally became comfortable with exploring my religion and my doubts. I explored a few other religions. Um, nothing really seemed to resonate with me and I came to the conclusion I didn't believe in any religion and I came to the conclusion I didn't even believe in any God. And so I decided to call myself a secular humanist which is essentially a type of atheist who espouses humanistic principles like loving other people and pursuit of knowledge, things like that. Um, when I went to college, I went in as an atheist. I actually became president of the atheist club at my university. And subhanAllah, the very first time I visited as a, a masjid was as president of the atheist club. <laughs> um, but uh, after a few years being involved in that community, I began to distance myself from it because there was an issue of disrespect um, towards people of faith, which I disagreed with. And it was after I distanced myself from them, that's when Islam started to come into play. It was just logical. So what really triggered it was just thinking things through. And as so the more and more issues that I saw with Mormonism, the more and more I clearly saw that it wasn't the truth, that this was not something divinely inspired. It just sort of pulled me farther and farther away from the ideas of religion. And as I explored other religions, I just found a lot of these same issues. And so that's what led me to the conclusion no religion was true. So when I went to mosque, I typically experienced what most converts experience. A lot of people were all of a sudden just so excited to meet a convert um, and they wanted to hear the story of how I became a Muslim, which was, I was very happy to share. Um, however, unfortunately, like what typically happens with converts is when I would finish telling the story, they would ooh, ah, masha Allah, and then turn away and ignore me. And so I felt very isolated in the mosques. The ones I went to were very clicky. Uh, I just didn't feel like I fit in there. And whenever people did want to talk to me, it was to tell me I was doing something wrong or try to push me to do this or that. One issue I came up against quite a bit was my name. I personally chose not to change my name because I have the honor of being named after two of my grandmothers and that's a very big part of my identity and I try to remember these two very great ladies when I conduct myself and it's just a huge part of who I am and I feel like it's a very Islamic name to carry the name of your mother's mothers, right? Um, so I didn't want to change my name but a lot of people have really pushed and, and there's been people who just decided for me my name is going to be Zainab and I love the lady Zainab if you want to talk about a feminist let's talk about Zainab but my name was Amanda and I didn't like some other individual just deciding for me what my name was going to be the, so uh, honestly the, the big challenges for me were just fighting through all this Wahhabi Salafi ideology and just feeling like I had a place in the community because I was so isolated when I went to the mosques um, and alhamdulillah, what made it easier for me after a year of being a Muslim and entering the school of Ahlul Bayt, I found this little teeny tiny Shia masjid that didn't even show up on Google. And it was run by this very nice couple who really took a lot of time to sit with me and talk to me. They loaned me about 20 books and they explained to me some of the cultural issues that I wasn't understanding and helped me really kind of get my head on straight. And if it wasn't for their generosity, I wouldn't be nearly as far as a Muslimah as I am today. So when I first started learning about the School of Ahlul Bayt, it was through Sayyidah Marnak Shawani's lectures. And as I was listening to these lectures, he would recite the Masa'ib at the end of his lectures. And to me, not knowing the story, it seemed very, whoa, calm down. <laughs> you know, I didn't understand what was so horrible. But I found the, the content of the lectures very interesting and a lot of my questions being answered. But I didn't really want to dig into what this horrible story was right away. What made me want to really find out what happened was when I heard what happened to Zainab because of my experience with hijab and what it meant to me. When I listened to the Masaib of how the chains are chafing the necks of the ladies, I thought, well, how could it be chafing if she'd have a scarf there? And then I thought, there's no way the granddaughter of the Prophet could have had to walk without her hijab. And I, I just, just froze and I thought, no way, I'm, I'm misunderstanding something. And so I, I go on the internet and I Google it. And I saw it was true that this great lady had this removed from her. And I just 
whew, I just felt shock and anger. And so I dug into the story of Hossein. I, I felt like that I was ready to know what happened. And even though it's a horrible story and one of a terrible injustice, at the same time I found it very inspiring because it is a stance for truth against falsehood. And as an American, I see it as a story of freedom against an oppressor. The reason my country exists is because we believed that we didn't have to accept the rule of an unjust ruler. So we got rid of King George. <laughs> and when I saw that story of Hossein, it, it resonated with me as an American. And I saw the concept of freedom in Islam. I saw the concept of justice. I saw the concept of rights. And it really empowered me as a Muslim, subhanAllah. I'd love to go to Karbala. I'd love to do ziyara of, of all the imma. Um, I'd actually really love to do the ziyara of Musa al Um Of all the ma'asumin, as I was learning about uh, the 12 imams, his story um, really was very, it was very interesting to me. And what I loved about him so much is that even though he was tortured and kept in prison and just muzlum his whole life, the akhlaq that he conducted himself with and his habit of always speaking to people highly is what made me respect him. And it's been a reminder for me when people have treated me poorly because I'm a Muslim or when I felt discriminated against because of my hijab. I remember the Musa, Musa al-Qadim and he was in a prison but still had akhlaq and I'm free so I should have the, the same akhlaq and inshallah I'd love to do his ziyara. Um, as for the concept of intercession at first I thought it was a little unusual it didn't make a lot of sense to me but what made it made what made it make sense was I realized people basically do this with each other all the time. So as a convert, people will ask me all the time to make dua for them. They'll say, oh, you're so great, and you're so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Please make dua for me, because he will answer you. And so it's basically the same thing. They are far closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than I could ever imagine. So I'm just asking them to make a dua for me. So my first Ramadan was very uplifting. Um, it's a really great experience to just kind of know what it is your body is capable of. And alhamdulillah, I met another sister there who was also Mormon and during in the middle of Ramadan, she also became a Muslim. Um, that's really, I guess that's it. My first Ramadan didn't really stick out. Um, what else can I say? To be honest, I actually spent my first Ramadan most of the time alone. Uh, and that was a difficulty for me because I was by myself in, in California. When I would go to the mosques, I was by myself and I knew everyone else was celebrating around me, but I was never invited for iftar. Um, and th this is something that is typical for converts. Um, we are very lonely a lot of the time, but Ramadan, it's really hard. So one recommendation I would give to Muslims who have been raised in Islam and have Muslim families too, please invite converts for iftar. So the story of Karbala for me is the story of just truth against justice for all of mankind. I mean, it wasn't just Muslims with the Imam Hussein, salam, there were Christians with him. And so for me, what I found most inspiring in that story was the idea that as a Muslim, I should fight for humanity and I should stand for humanity. And it, this meant a lot to me because my stepfather was a refugee and he had come from a very ugly civil war in Central America. And so human rights and standing for justice were always things I cared about a great deal. And it's the reason I, I chose to go into international studies as my major. And so to see the idea of standing for mankind as such a focal point within Islam, whereas in this Wahhabi Salafi tradition, it's just completely missing. That's what resonated with me, and that's the big lesson that I take from it. So I do think Muslims do need to be more active um, talking about Islam, and the School of Ahl al-Bayt in particular really needs to take the lead. Unfortunately, most Muslims who are converting to Islam are converting into Sunni Islam kind of by default, because the dominance of information available in America is from Sunni Islam. The dominant groups out there doing dawah are all Sunnis. But the School of Ahl al-Bayt has a very unique position to reach Western people because we have that sense of akhlaq that unfortunately is just hidden in this Wahhabi Salafi ideology. 
and we have the story of Hossein for Americans in particular to hear the story of a man standing for truth and justice and freedom freed and I'm sorry to hear the story of a man standing for truth and justice and human rights that is at the heart and soul of every single American. And if you look in our history, the characters that we respect the most are George Washington and Martin Luther King, people who stood for justice against a very strong force against it. And so if more Americans heard the story of Imam and Hussein, the entire view of the religion of Islam is going to change. So for people out there who are interested in learning more about Islam, I would recommend being very open um, to some very different ideologies. At first things are going to seem very strange and unusual, but try to look at the deeper meanings of things. So for example, hijab, on the outside, a lot of Western people are going to jump to the conclusion that it's oppressive. But if you look in that philosophy and that ideology of things underlying it, you're going to see it's the exact opposite. So be open-minded and don't be afraid to, to look beyond the cover of things. So for all the Muslims out there who have converts in their community, my message to you is to please try to make a convert feel included in the community. Make sure we know what's going on so we can be at the masjid and be with others. Invite us for iftar in Ramadan and to other um, events in your family and in your home. We became Muslimi to be Muslimi. We don't want to just be the convert. We want to be another Muslim like anyone else. And so, inshallah, if we're included more, we'll feel that way. And you'll see more of us in the masjids more often.